The walls may be paneled in rare wood or simple plaster. The ceilings lofty or low. The floors of shining marble or of finely loomed carpets. But the contents do not vary. These are the icons of justice, each symbolic of a nation in which government serves at the will of the people. A government bound by fixed rules for every member of society, without exception for rank or wealth. The purpose of those who gather in these rooms is to recount a past event from two perspectives before an impartial audience, to evaluate the facts based on law as explained by a judge, and decide the outcome. Consider the symbols. This station is for a court reporter who records every word of a trial to establish a written record. Documentation is a reliable way of identifying errors, and at times it's used in support of an appeal. During criminal trials, this table is occupied by a representative of the clerk of court's office. In civil cases, a representative of the prothonotary's office is seated here. In either case, the person at this table administers oaths to the jury, a promise to tell the truth and give careful consideration to the evidence. Promises of truth-telling are also administered to the witnesses who testify. I do. The clerk also marks records and exhibits and takes care of them throughout the trial. A summary of the case, rulings by the judge, and the verdict are also recorded by the clerk. Each trial session opens with an age-old proclamation by the tip staff. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, all manner of persons having anything to do before the Honorable Shirley Ann Dorney, Judge of the Court of Common Pleas, here hold this day, let them come forward and they shall be heard. God save the Commonwealth and this Honorable Court. You may be seated. The ancient symbol of the authority of this office is no longer evident in most courts, but the visible presence of the office, a tip staff, is ever present as a reminder that courtroom battles are waged only with words. Tip staff's responsibilities include overseeing the security of the jury during its deliberations. Sheriff's deputies are present in court to enforce court rules of behavior. This table is reserved for the district attorney in criminal trials and the plaintiff's attorney in civil trials. The district attorney brings charges of wrongdoing on behalf of the state seeking to hold an accused person accountable. The plaintiff's attorney brings civil claims on behalf of aggrieved individuals seeking to recover monetary damages. During criminal trials, this is the defense table. It is occupied by the accused called the defendant and his counsel. The respondent or defendant in civil trials also sits at this table with their counsel. This is a witness box. In civil and criminal proceedings, lawyers on each side call witnesses to support their case. In criminal cases, witnesses sit here as they testify. If a witness is instructed to answer a question and refuses, they can be held in contempt of court by the judge. There are exceptions to this rule known as privileged communications. They include doctor-patient, lawyer-client exchanges. If a witness could be endangered by their testimony, the court provides protective custody. It's the responsibility of the prosecutor to prove the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt. The Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution provides the right to remain silent. Defendants have no obligation to ever testify. Often the defendant does not testify. Anyone accused of a crime is presumed innocent unless and until evidence and facts prove otherwise. The judge explains the law to the jury, which then decides the verdict based on the facts. This barrier, known as the bar, separates participants in a trial from the public gallery. Jury trials are open to the public and the press to respectfully attend and observe the proceedings. This is the area where the public is seated. The judge enters from chambers, the jury from the jury room. Entry through the bar rail is reserved for lawyers, which explains how lawyers have become known as members of the bar. For the more than 4,000 years of recorded law, a chair on an elevated dais has represented the seat of judgment, making this perhaps the oldest symbol of all, referred to as the bench. Up until the 17th century, judges arrayed in flamboyant robes of the finest fabric, crowned by powdered wigs, were the norm. But English jurists of that period began wearing more somber attire during periods of mourning for kings. 
Black judicial robes were adopted for all court occasions by colonial American judges on the advice of Thomas Jefferson, who suggested robes suitable to the dignity of the office be worn to avoid extravagant, needless official apparel, such as bright, ostentatious robes and wigs. The gavel first appeared in 6th century Scandinavia as the magical hammer wielded by Thor, the mythical patron of justice. It came to represent judicial authority. At trial, the judge holds each side of a case to standards of law and rules of conduct. It is a judge's duty to be impartial, giving no advantage to either side. The judge keeps the playing field of the court fair by requiring adherence to the rule of law and evidence and thoughtful instruction of law to juries. The judge rules on law, oversees verdicts, imposes sentences in criminal cases, and can award damages in civil trials. Much of a judge's time is spent in chambers reviewing law and studying cases with the able assistance of law clerks and administrative staff. A judge's role is difficult. The indispensable work of judges is essential to just outcomes. This is the most important symbol in any trial. It is the jury box where 12 people, the guardians of freedom, selected at random from the public decide facts of guilt or innocence, right or wrong. Thanks in part to William Penn, juries performed this valuable task without fear of penalty. In 1670, 11 years before he came to America, Penn, an ardent Quaker, defied English law which forbade preaching in public. The peace-loving Penn was arrested, charged with disturbing the king's peace and inciting a riot. Brought to trial, he was removed from the courtroom when he objected to the evidence against him as unconvincing. He was therefore not present when the judge instructed the jury to find him guilty on all charges or suffer the consequences. When the jury did not convict Penn on all charges, the angry judge imposed hefty fines on them. One juror, Edward Bushell, refused to pay the fine, whereupon the judge ordered him to prison without meat, drink, fire, or tobacco for an indeterminate period. William Penn argued successfully, what hope is there of ever having justice done when juries are threatened? A royal appeals court heard the case and ruled once and for all that juries could not be fined or punished for their verdicts and ordered the immediate release of Bushel, who had languished in prison for two months. The fines were refunded. This precedent prevails and protects juries to this day. William Penn's right to a fair trial was secured when the right of juries to reach verdicts without fear was established. The essence of all jury decisions is common sense reasoning and the assumption no one is guilty unless proven so. The right to be judged fairly by ordinary citizens rather than government officials is preserved only by citizens who are fully aware that jury duty is not only a privilege, it is the cornerstone of their own freedom. If the jury keeps the promise of justice for free people, the means by which jurors are selected is of great importance. Selection is made by a process called venire. It is a method by which jury pools are randomly compiled from public lists, such as voter rolls, driver registration lists, tax records, and other public records that are inclusive of all citizens, old and young, rich and poor. As names are drawn, official notice is delivered to each person selected for service. The notification includes information about when and where to appear, park, what to wear, and what not to bring to court. A juror questionnaire with the notice helps the court confirm a juror's eligibility. The notice of service arrives in sufficient time to adjust personal schedules. There is no excuse for tardiness. Delays at security screenings, parking issues, and other unpredictable circumstances must be taken into consideration by the juror. Respect for the importance of serving on a jury panel is demonstrated by turnout, which is neat, modest, and simple. Clothing that attracts attention or is dirty, gaudy, or revealing is unacceptable. This large room is called the jury assembly room. It's the place prospective jurors gather. A court official calls the roll, answers questions, and explains the events jurors can expect. Jurors are reminded of the privilege and obligation of being a juror. Jury service is respected and appreciated. 
Prospective jurors remain in the assembly room until they are electronically called to a particular courtroom for a process called voir dire, which means to speak the truth. Does the fact that you know the judge and have worked for her affect your ability to be fair and impartial? Lawyers for each side and the judge ask jurors questions to consider what a juror's response to their case might be. Some jurors are eliminated for no reason at all by what are called preemptory challenges. Others are eliminated with cause for reasons of obvious bias, such as knowing someone on either side of the case or any conflict that could influence a decision. The juror questionnaire is part of the selection process. Questions that influence selection are based on determining a juror's ability to be fair and open-minded, which is the clear understanding that in criminal trials, no one can be found guilty of a crime unless they are proved to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In civil cases, a preponderance of proof is necessary. When 12 jurors are selected, the jury is seated. Those not chosen return to the assembly room to await their next call. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Judge Jordan. Court procedures are highly structured events. At the beginning of each trial, the judge welcomes the jury. Then a lawyer representing each side of the case presents the story of the events surrounding the case from their perspective. The entire focus of every presentation throughout the trial is directed to the essential audience of every trial, the jury. The prosecution in criminal cases, or the plaintiff in civil cases, speaks first. Plato observed rhetoric, that is to say, carefully crafted words are the weapons in court battles. When the defense has made its opening argument, the prosecution or plaintiff can call witnesses in support of their case and submit evidence according to strict rules which are enforced by the judge. Following that, the defense may call witnesses if it chooses. The defense may present evidence to disprove the case of the opposing side, but the defendant has no obligation to prove anything in a criminal case. When the defense completes its presentation, the prosecution has one last opportunity to call witnesses and rebut the defense. At the end of the trial, lawyers make closing arguments summarizing their case to the jury. Then each side rests. The judge explains the law to the jury and what is expected of them before they can begin deliberating the case. All jury discussions are held in secret in a locked room. A jury foreman is elected by jurors to guide discussion. Jurors are forbidden to discuss or seek more information about the case outside the jury room. If a juror gains any information of the trial outside the jury room, he is duty bound to report it to the judge immediately. A juror is never to accept a favor of any sort having to do with the case. If the jury has questions, they are delivered to the judge by a tip staff who remains stationed outside the jury room to attend to jurors' needs or requests. Jury identification badges are worn by jurors in the judicial center at all times to put people on notice they are serving on a jury as a protection against a juror accidentally seeing or hearing anything about a case. When a decision is reached, the jury returns to the courtroom and the foreman reports the verdict. The judge enters the verdict into the court record, thanks and dismisses the jurors. Court is then adjourned. Jurors have no obligation to explain their decision. Having done their duty, jurors return to private life surely reflecting on the experience and quite possibly finding themselves in agreement with the words of Thomas Jefferson. I consider trial by jury the only anchor yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. <laughs>